Hello everyone, this is Priyanshi Gupta here. So in this video, we are going to talk about RabbitMQ, how RabbitMQ actually works. We will dive deep into the RabbitMQ architecture and, and understand each of its component. And we will see how you can actually create a robust system, a fully reliable system using, using RabbitMQ. So we will explore various functionalities of RabbitMQ and what protocol it actually uses. So it's going to be a detailed video and this is going to be a one-stop solution for all the things about RabbitMQ. So if you have watched this, uh, watched this video, then there will be no need for you to check about RabbitMQ anywhere else. And I've also attached one detailed document about RabbitMQ in the description box of this video. You can check that out also. And basically before making any video, I do a lot of research. So while doing my research, I was preparing the document and I think I have covered everything in that. So you can definitely check that out. And if you watch this video, it will be more easy for you to consume the knowledge because here I will be using various kind of diagrams and other stuff. So it will be very easy for you to actually uh, grasp the concept and understand it. Also, I think you might feel that I post videos uh, not very regularly and that happens just because I do a lot of research before making any video. So, so in, because I generally prefer quality over quantity. So that is my basic goal. And before we move further, I would request you all to support this channel by liking this video and subscribing to my channel and sharing this video with your friends as much as possible. So now, uh, without wasting time, let's get started here. So first, let's see what this RabbitMQ actually is. So this RabbitMQ is nothing but a message broker. And this message broker is basically a way of communication between two processes or two services. Now, what I mean by this is, suppose let's say you have one machine. This is your basically your laptop or computer on which one process is running. This is P1 and there is an, another process that is running on your system and that, and that is P2. Now you want something to come, uh, but now you want this P1 to communicate with this P2. So how will this communication happen? This communication can happen through various ways like using shared resources or you can also use a manager process which will be managing the resources between these two processes or you can basically make REST API calls between these two processes or there are a lot of more ways through which you can do that. But one more way is using message broker. And how will this happen? I will tell you later on. And one more use case is there when this message broker actually plays a very important role and that is in a microservice kind of architecture. So suppose let's say you have one service which is running over one server and this is another service which is running over another server. If these two services are running on the same server, then it will be like two processes on a same machine. But if two services are running on different server, then how will you basically communicate be between these two services? One way is using REST APIs. Second is basically RPC, which is, which is basically resource procedure calls, but I'm not going to cover about this. And I think this you are already aware about. Now third is message broker. But now how will this service one will actually communicate to service two using this message broker? So this message broker is nothing but a message queue. And if you are from computer science background, then you must be aware about this queue. Queue is nothing but a data structure which works on FIFO mechanism. That is first in first out. So suppose let's say there is one queue and you push something to it. Suppose first this message was pushed inside this queue, then message two then this message three and then message four. So first thing that we will take out from this message from this message queue is this M1. This will move out first. So first in first out. This is called as FIFO mechanism. So similarly, this message broker uses this message queue. And suppose let's say this is a this is one another server. It's also possible that this message broker might be running on the same server on which service one is running or on this server on which service two is running. But suppose let's say we have an another server with, on which this message broker 
instance or process is running so this is a process of message broker and inside this it has a data structure that is queue basically so what will happen is the service one will push the message to this queue and the service two will take that message as an input from this queue so here in this case specifically this service one is publisher or we can say it's a producer and service two in this case is basically a consumer so in this way this communication will happen and why we have used this message broker instead of this rest apis and rpc because this rest apis is not very reliable because this totally depends on http protocol and these uh, and this totally depends on uh, networks and this networks and the packet sent over networks is not fully reliable we can't be sh completely sure that this packet that we have sent uh, reaches to server 2 or not it's possible that service 1 hits the rest api of service 2 then service 2 basically process that uh, rest api and then fails to give a response back or it's possible that it gives a response back but then the message is dropped because of certain network issues or maybe the connection between the service 1 and service 2 is broken or so it's possible that service 1 is down so there are different ways in which this rest apis are not reliable so one way is you use a background worker which will basically sync the information between these two services or another way is using this message broker but how do this message broker provides a full reliability so for knowing that we will have to go out deep into this rabbit mq architecture and see how it actually guarantees the 100% assurity and reliability so that will be our main focus in this video so this is a basic diagram of how our message broker actually works but now we will actually understand how this rabbit mq actually works okay so rabbit mq is a message broker that is done another point that is important about this rabbit mq is it supports various protocols and by protocols what i mean is set of rules and the protocol supported by this rabbit mq are one is amqp 091 one is amqp 10 which is a upgraded version of this amqp 091 then we have mqtt then we have stomp but but since we are just starting to learn how this rabbit mq works the best way to understand the rabbit mq architecture and mechanism is by understanding this amqp 091 protocol so, and usually developers use this protocol only this is very popular which people generally use with this rabbit mq okay so we will try to understand and explore this amqp 091 and once we have a good hands on over this protocol and this rabbit mq basic functionalities then we can actually explore these protocols also because the basic concept will remain same only the protocol difference some protocol difference will come but that is something that we can explore later on right now let's focus on this protocol okay and what i mean by this amqp 091 protocol is this is basically a application layer protocol so instead of actually understanding this rabbit mq it's important that we first understand what is this amqp 091 so it's an application layer protocol now this is something related to networking and i'm not going to dive deep into the networking part but just to explain you in brief what is this amqp 091 and how it works at application layer we will just see a basics of networking and let's focus on that first so suppose let's say this is computer one or we can say this is it is server one and this is computer two okay now there is one process running over this computer one and this process one is nothing but a process that you have coded or maybe it's a application that you have installed on your system and here also one process is running let's name it process two it's running over here and now suppose let's say this process one wants to send a packet or a message to this process two which is running over computer two or server two or maybe we can say it's a service one and it's a service two okay so how will this communication will actually happen 
So that communication happens using a various set of protocols, right? A basic standards that we have to follow to route a message from this computer to this, this computer. Because this is a kind of a communication, right? And when you generally communicate with another person, what happens is you use some sort of language which you and the person you are communicating to knows, understands. Suppose let's say you are communicating in English, then the another person who is listening to your words should actually know English, right? Only then you will be able to communicate. So it's a language or we can say set of rules because the language has set of rules which you have to follow and the person who is listening to you should also have to follow and that should be same exactly. Only then you can collaborate with each other. So set of rules. And this language will be common to process one, uh, to this computer one and computer two also. Okay. Then we have medium. What kind of medium we are using? Suppose let's say you are communicating to another person orally. So you are using air, right? Then we have basically some sort of energy conversion. And what I mean by this is basically when you communicate with another person, you are basically converting your uh, energy that you have got from the food that you have eaten to the sound energy. Okay. Similarly, when you communicate with from one computer to another computer, it also uses some sort of energy conversion. So now let's apply these concepts to the actual communication that is happening between these two computers. So what is happening is, Suppose let's say this process 1 is written in Python and this process 2 is written in Java. So these are written in different languages. So we cannot say that the code that is written over here should like this process 2 should actually understand that there should be something which is independent of these languages. Uh, so basically when we create a message using this language inside this process 1, it should be in such a way that this Java code can actually understand that. So how will we ensure that? So for this thing, we have another set of rules or standards that we normally call as protocols. And now in case of medium, this communication can happen over a wire or maybe through wireless media. So it can happen over a wire or maybe wireless medium like air and energy conversion. If I talk about, suppose let's say if you are using this wire, then it is happening over electric current, right? You will be sending some electric currents here. So suppose let's say you are providing some power to this computer, electricity, and you are sending over the wire, then of course there will be not such a, a proper conversion here. So this computer will basically consume this electric signals and do some combination and all that stuff using circuits and make a proper message using that and send it over the channel. But if you are using, suppose, let's say if you're using an air medium or a wireless medium, then what will happen is this electricity will be converted into uh, radio waves, which is an electromagnetic energy. So this energy conversion will happen and you will send the packets here and you will send the message in such a way that here sh there should be something which can interpret that message. All right. So these protocols, and all these things happen in various layers inside a computer. So people have standardized that into seven layers. Okay. And this is called as OSI model of networking. And now this OSI model has seven layers. First is basically application layer. Second is presentation layer and third is session layer, fourth is transport layer and fifth is network layer, sixth is data link layer and the last one is physical. Now if I talk about these layers every layer has its own set of protocols. Okay. Its own set of protocols.
So if I talk about this AMQP091, this protocol works at this layer. Okay, and these three layers are somewhat related to software. So we can say that these are software layers. And if I talk about this transport layer, this is heart of OSI. And these three layers are somewhat related to hardware. Because these three layers are designed in such a way or the protocols defined in these layers are defined in such a way that they are restricted to or are designed in such a way that has to be configured with the kind of hardware that a computer is using like a, how the CPU is designed what kind of architecture the CPU is using so according to that the protocols written over these layers actually work so if I talk about tra at transport layer there are some protocols like TCP UDP at network layer we have IP which is internet protocol and let's not talk about more layers here because this this video is more about this rabbit MQ and AMQP. So let's focus on that. And suppose let's say this AMQP is at application layer. Okay. So normally if I divide these layers into a much more understandable manner, what happens is this layer is physical layer, which is somewhat related, very specific to the hardware that you are using. Suppose let's say ethernet cable or the wire medium, or if you are using something to generate the radio waves, so that is somewhat related at physical layer. But now if I talk about these two layers, which are network and uh, sorry, not here, basically transport network and data link layer. These three layers are actually responsible for routing the message. Okay, these three layers are actually responsible for routing the message from here to here. And this layer, which is session layer, this is somewhat related to uh, behavioral layer. It is a kind of a behavioral layer. Okay, and these two layers, which are application and presentation, these two layers are something that a software developer generally uses. Okay, normally when you code, your code generally interferes with these two layers. Okay, so you are directly or indirectly interfering with these two layers. Suppose let's say you have written some code in Python and you want to hit the REST API of this service 2 or process 2 of this server 2. Okay, so what will happen is you will use request module of Python or maybe this module is different in different language if you are using some different language here. So that module you will basically install from uh, pip like it's a kind of a Python pip package which you will install right on your system and using that module some code is already written over here which will generally interfere with these layers right and you will say I want to connect with this with this IP address using this protocol that is HTTP protocol. So the HTTP is also a kind of an application layer protocol. And once you have done that, like you have specified in your Python code that I want to use this request module, which is a Python package, and you want to connect to this uh, IP address on this protocol, then what will happen is your request module will actually work at this application and somewhat presentation layer also, and make a proper packet of that message. Suppose let's say you want to pass certain payload here in this HTTP request. So that is our payload basically here. This is a payload. So this request module, what it will do is it will make a packet or a data packet, which will have all this information like this protocol information, this IP address, this destination address, uh, the source address, this payload and all that information will be packed inside a data packet. So that is a role of request module. So it will generate a packet that is that will satisfy all the rules of this HTTP protocol. Okay. And once the packet is uh, developed here, then what will happen is it will move to next layer. And at this layer, basically session layer, transport layer, network layer, data link layer, physical layer, at these layers, your code will not directly interfere here. 
what your code will do is it will trigger the OS commands because your code do not have privileges to run that code because it's it is somewhat related to hardware so here comes the role of operating system you will trigger certain commands of operating system uh, which are written in operating system code and operating system will take care of that so now once you have made this packet your module uh, or the code that you have written have created this packet now os code will run over these layers and every layer will add certain new information here suppose that, let's say at session layer it will add certain information okay and then at transport layer again certain new information will be added over here i will talk about this tcp later on but it at every layer some extra information will be added as a header now if i talk about this network layer at network layer what will happen is suppose let's say this packet is uh, at network layer also some information will be added like here like this will be here and some more information will be added but now it's also possible that this packet is very large which is not a, uh, and this uh, wire or the channel that you are using it's not possible to send this whole packet in a single go to this uh, medium because it's not supporting that so this network layer what it will do is it will break this big packet into small chunks or packets and this network layer will add some extra information to each of this packet and if we are using this internet protocol here it will basically add the source address the ip address of the source machine and the ip address of the destination uh, address so and also some more information that is specific to this protocol so in this way it will break this big packet into small chunks and then this data link and physical layer will basically move these packets over this uh, medium that we are using so that is a basic brief about how this networking actually works but now if we focus on this amqp091 which is also a application layer protocol so this what this amqp091 will do first of all is uh, suppose let's say this is a computer and now you want to uh, and this is basically a client and why client because it is gen it wants to communicate to a server on which RabbitMQ is running okay on which RabbitMQ is running and RabbitMQ is uh, and you have defined this RabbitMQ in such a way that it is using AMQP091 protocol so if now the computer one has to communicate with this RabbitMQ it will also have to follow the same protocol that RabbitMQ is following okay because so that it if it pass certain instructions it is understand it is understandable to this RabbitMQ also so what this computer one will do is at application layer uh, and first of all suppose let's say you are writing some uh, you have written some process here you have written some code here which is running as a process over this computer one and from this process one you want to connect to this rabbit mq and it's possible that you might have written this pyth this process this uh, and it's possible that you have written this code either in python or java or anything and for that thing you will also have to install a basic code so that you don't have to actually uh, go at this layers and actually form this packet by yourself because it's not your responsibility actually so there are developers who have who have already designed certain code which you can actually import directly and hit the function of that and that library will take care of everything like how to send this packet to the celebrity MQ server so that is called as basically client library If I talk about Python, you have Pika module. And if I talk about Java, then there is another module available, which you can directly install. Now, it, what your code will do is, suppose let's say you created one message, and in this message you have a payload, which has certain keys and value, and you want to send this payload to this RabbitMQ server and you call one function of the speaker module or the client library module that we're using that I want to send 
and this function written as send message inside this module which you call directly and pass this payload and now this pika module or this client library module will construct a packet accordingly according to the amkb protocol and send this packet to the next layers okay similarly what is happening over here and it will send these uh, and it, this packet will pass through various layers and it will be sent over the channel and the listener that is written over here is listening to the, these packets it will listen to, the, to this packet and decode this packet again because it goes through various encryption algorithms here and it will be encapsulated into a packet but now in order to decode that packet there also should be something here so again this server also will have seven layers right because this computer is also using a OSI model similarly this server is also using a OSI model and this will also have seven layers and now this message will go in reverse fashion from last layer to the top layer because the code written over here uh, will understand the packet from here right because only at this stage it is understandable to the programming language in which the code has been written uh, of this RabbitMQ okay because at this stage only it is actually readable by that programming language here so this packet is created in such a way that it is independent of the programming language you are using so again it will pass through various layers and it will be decoded to the top layer which is application layer and now RabbitMQ server has various code written over here so now it will say okay we have re received a request for connection from this computer one so we will make a connection over here so that is basically how this AMQP works okay and controls how the packet is actually uh, made at this layer so this is basically this is a basic knowledge of networking that you should actually know before understanding the RabbitMQ architecture now let's dive into the AMQP091 model basically this AMQP091 has various functionalities because the message that you have constructed at this stage right at this application layer this packet has various information okay this has information about various various components that this AMQP demands actually so let's understand what all components this AMQP actually expects because when this because people have created this RabbitMQ on AMQP protocol so they have created this RabbitMQ in such a way that it supports various functionalities that are supported at this AMQP and AMQP is nothing but a set of rules right so we will see what all information is there in this packet okay so in order to understand that packet at which is formed at application layer we will ha actually have to understand what kind of model this AMQP091 actually expects like if the message broker is written over this protocol it expects message broker to be written in such a way that it follows that model okay so if we talk about this client which is a publisher uh, suppose let's say this is a service one and this is a publisher or producer and this is service two which is a consumer here and we have another server on which RabbitMQ is running so RabbitMQ has various components and not RabbitMQ basically we are talking about this AMQP091 model here so this AMQP091 model expects RabbitMQ or the message broker which is built over this protocol it expects that pro uh, it expects that message broker to have certain components so one component is basically exchange and now this exchange uh, and beside this exchange we also have queues okay uh, so what will happen is first this publisher will publish a message and this pub and this message will be sent to this exchange and this exchange responsibility is to route message to the queues that it has to and then this consumer can listen to various queues over here it can listen to this queue also it can listen to this queue also or this also it's responsibility of this consumer to which queue it actually wants to listen to so how this exchange routes this information to various queues and how this consumer listen to various queues and how this publisher actually publishes the information to this exchange 
that we will see later on. But let's try to understand what this AMQP091 is first of all. So if I talk about what we have already understood, that is a packet formation at application layer. This is application layer. And suppose this packet has been made by the client library. And this has various information, the message that you want to send and certain more information. So this packet will also have information about this exchange. When this publisher is publishing the message to this, uh, to this basically this rabbit MQ. And it's also possible that this packet also have information about Q. Right. And it might also have certain more information about the connection. Because you have to establish a connection first between this, S, this service one and exchange. Right. So all these things which are related to AMQP, all this information will be covered in this packet. So if message broker is using this AMQP protocol and it has not, uh, it, it do not have this exchange a queue, it will not be able to decode this packet properly and understand exactly what it is saying. So it will not be able to work accordingly properly if it do not follow all the, all the rules that are defined in this protocol. So AMQP091 expects this kind of model. All right. So now I think we have covered a lot about this AMQP and we have a good understanding how this AMQP actually behaves and what it actually demands, right? And before moving further, I want to say that AMQP has components, some we have already looked on, but if we talk about this uh, specifically, we have publisher, we have consumer, we have exchange. These things are something which are defined inside this protocol and various functionalities and various functions which are defined also inside the CMQP. Suppose let's say you have to establish a connection between the service and exchange. So it has a specific function for that. And that function information can also be present inside this packet. Function information. So that this rabbit MQ will see, okay, this function is present over this packet. So I will establish a connection between this service one and, ex and this rabbit MQ. Okay. So publisher, consumer exchange, then we have channels. Then we have connection. And there are various more other components and all that details I have already added in the document that is added in the description box of the video. So you can check out more about that in that, uh, in that document because the major focus of this video is to understand how RabbitMQ actually works and how to, est how to create a reliable system. Okay. First to have an overview, how it's working, like by going deep dive into it and then understanding how to how to make a reliable system, a robust system using RabbitMQ because you can't say that I'm using RabbitMQ and you just say, okay, it's your responsibility. You will take care of that. You can't be, you can't do that. You will have to make certain configurations to, in order to make RabbitMQ more robust. You will have to follow certain basic, uh, be, uh, like best practices in order to make your system 100% uh, reliable. And how you can do that configuration? First, you will have to understand how things are actually working. So that is what we are doing here. 